Hello, hello everybody. My name is Dr. Horman and I will be your instructor during the semester as we make our way through a very exciting lecture. This is molecular and cell biology. Now the nice thing about molecular and cell is that it basically takes all the different topics that you've sort of come across in your different biology classes and it combines it and it adds a little bit more detail and a lot more examples onto it. This is a fantastic class. I hope you guys will enjoy taking it as much as I will enjoy teaching it for you. Um, now, before we actually get into the lecture part, I want to make sure that everybody kind of knows where to go for all their different tools and books and all the different resources that Malek and Sal come with. So first things first, if you haven't done so already, please make sure that you read the syllabus as well as the class schedule because you want to know exactly what we're going to be doing each week and you definitely want to know, besides all the rules and regulations and how to contact me, you want to also definitely know how exactly your grade is going to be calculated. Now within the syllabus, you're also going to notice that I have this little statement um, where I just tell you that you do not have to worry about logging in to the course on a specific day or time for lecture, and that is because I am going to be pre-recording all our lectures. So at your leisure during the week, please make sure that you schedule some time so that you can sit down and you can listen to the YouTube videos. And as you're listening to the videos, please make sure that you take really good notes because when it's time for us to take our exam, I write all my own exam questions based on what we lectured about in the PowerPoint notes. So having said that, you're going to notice that um, after you read the chapters in the book, because yes, you should still be reading the book, there will be some sections that I might only cover surface level, or there might be some sections that I skip overall. I don't want you to stress about those particular sections on your exam. Instead, what you're going to see is that we'll have some online assignments that will encompass those sections as well. So you'll get full exposure to all the topics that are in the book. But keep in mind that when it's time for us to take our exam, you want to make sure that you fully focus on the PowerPoints and obviously the YouTube lectures. And speaking of the PowerPoints, please note that the same PowerPoint that you're seeing through this video has also been downloaded for you onto D2L. So you can feel free to kind of make your notes on it and then that way you can kind of follow along as I um, talk about all our different topics. The other thing that I want to mention is that the book does come with an online component and I would really recommend that within the first week of class that you get access to the book. You can purchase the book either through the bookstore and you'll get a hard copy and when that hard copy arrives there'll be a code on the inside that'll give you access to the companion student site. Or if you prefer an ebook, you can just go ahead and follow the link that's been posted on D2L. There's a little folder that talks about the book and how to purchase it. Go ahead and follow that link and you'll be able to purchase access to the ebook as well as the student companion site. And I do want to say that everybody gets 21 days free on the student companion site, which comes with access to the ebook. So that means that starting on day one of class, everybody can have access to the text and the companion site. However, it will limit your access to chapters one, two, and three. And unfortunately, exam one will cover chapters one, two, and four. So you have a few weeks to decide if you want to get a hard cover of the book or if you want to get the ebook. Um, if you have an older edition of the book, you will have to purchase access through um, the companion website still to get access to all the different online components. Now, on the website, the student companion website, there are a few different resources that you can utilize. They have given you flashcards to make it easier to kind of comprehend the different parts of the chapter. Um, there are different slides that will provide a little bit more information um, or different illustrations of the topic. So I would definitely recommend that you kind of peruse through the student resources or companion site. There will also will be some graded work that you'll be doing, and there are two main assignments that you come across on the website. One of them is a what they considered a pre-reading assignment. So before you kind of like peruse through the chapter, or I would actually say after you peruse through the chapter and taking a look at the notes, um, there are some questions that will both post to you, kind of see where your knowledge lies. 
I would actually recommend that you do the questions after you do the chapter, just to kind of test your familiarity. These pre-assignments are completely optional. They do, are, they do give you a point value of one point, and that's because I have to put in a point value for the assignment to be valid. But that one point literally means nothing to your grade. Um, so they are completely optional and they can't really affect your grade. Then there are going to be what we like to call our post-reading assignments, and these are going to be little homework assignments that you're going to come across. You definitely want to make sure that you do those. They're called problem sets. Each chapter that we discuss will come with a problem set that will have about 10 to 12 questions that are posted on the companion website. Please reference the syllabus for all the different due dates, as well as the time limit and the number of attempts that you have to complete these assignments. Each of these assignments is worth 10 points, and like I said, you'll have one for each of the chapters that we will be discussing for our lecture. Now, the other thing that I want to mention, and I know my mentions are getting a little lengthy, um, is please keep in mind that just because we are not meeting face-to-face, -face, I am still fully available for you to come and chit-chat and tell me about your concerns, your comments, and your questions related to molecular cell biology. In fact, what I've done is I've dedicated our original class time which is Tuesdays and Thursdays um, at 9.30 to uh, make them virtual office hours. So you can go ahead and during Tuesdays and Thursdays from 9.30 to about 10.50, feel free to just jump on D2L, click that little communication tab that's on the top menu and find Blackboard Collaborate. And I will be sitting there in my virtual office ready for any of your chit chat that you would like to have. If that time does not work for you, well then don't worry. My email is always available. Just go ahead and send me an email and I'll get back to you as soon as possible. And obviously we can also set up a face-to-face -face at a different time um, or day. So please don't let it stop you from contacting me because we're not meeting face-to-face. -face. My goal is to get you nice and comfortable with the material so that when it's time to take our exam, not only are you not anxious to take the exam because you have confidence in the material, but you also do very well on the exam. And that's what I'd like to see. I'd like all of us to be very successful in Malek and Cell and not only enjoy the content, but also get a nice grade so we can move on to our next course and finish up this degree that we are aiming for. All right, so I think that's all. Um, how about we get started by talking about chapter one? Chapter one is a fantastic introduction chapter. It is going to show you or it's going to tell you all about the cell. And I hope that as I'm lecturing on the material, some of you are going, I already know this. This is a little bit of a review. That is fantastic information to hear. So then in that case, just go ahead and sit back, listen to my little raspy, lispy voice, and let's start talking about the cells, which are the fundamental unit of life. All right, so this entire chapter is broken down into five sections. We're gonna chit chat about how cells have unity and diversity. We're gonna talk about the microscope, which was a huge contributor to a lot of the scientific information we have about what cells do, how they reproduce, what they actually look like. And then we're gonna spend quite a bit of time comparing and contrasting a prokaryotic cell versus a eukaryotic cell. And then towards the end of the chapter, we're gonna take a look at some of the organisms that we call model organisms, because in science, we like to utilize them in our research to learn more about the internal workings of the cell, the developmental pattern of the cell, and of course, transcription, translation, all of the mechanics that go within a properly functioning cell. All right, so let's go ahead and take a look at this picture. Um, this, this illustration from the book shows us the fact that cells come in a wide variety of shapes and sizes. Now, what we usually tend to see is that based on research, we estimate that there are about 100 million different species out there. And each species is composed of at least one cell, but the cell can have a completely different appearance. And oftentimes that will go with its overall function that will come into play. So if you look at the first box, box number A, what we're looking at here is a good old fashioned neuron. And as we're looking at the neuron, we see that it's relatively flat, 
It has lots of branch-like extension. Here you can see the little axon, the singular axon that it has that leads over to the soma, which is the nucleus or the control center of the neuron. And then all these smaller extensions, these are going to be the dendrites. Now, if you recall from your studies of the nervous system, the dendrites are the ones that will receive the input or the signal. That signal is then processed in the soma, center part right here, and then the mechanism of action is then expelled down the axon, and then these electrical signals are then sent over to their target cells. So for instance, you might recall from your neuromuscular junction how these neurons will work together with the muscle cells, and as the nerve signal comes down, it causes the release of acetylcholine, which ultimately leads to the muscle to get excited, and in its excitement, it will contract. Picture B is one of my favorite organisms. It is a unicellular protozoa that is just very cute under any type of microscope, um, particularly this one is with a little electron microscope, and that is a paramecium. A paramecium is a unicellular protozoa, as I mentioned before. And what's unique about this electron microscope image is that it allows you to see the millions of little cilia that it has. And these fine little thin hairs will beat in unison. And this is what the paramecium will use to kind of glide through its environment, which obviously is an aquatic type of setting. Um, Picture C, what do you guys think that is? Looks pretty cool, huh? You could see that these are individual cells that are very uniquely clustered together. And I won't lie, I had to look up what this was. I have to actually refer back to the book to see what it was. But it is a Snapdragon flower petal. How cool is that? So that is an example of a plant cell. Now, a lot of the actual rigid structure of the cell for the plants will come from the fact that plants, in addition to a plasma membrane, have a cell wall, which allow for the cells to have more of a uniform shape than, um, for instance, an animal cell. Figure D is a macrophage. Now, macrophages are a type of white blood cell. And what we see happening over here is that its plasma membrane is very fluid. It's allowed to create what we call these little pseudopods, these little extensions, which work out great because macrophages love to do phagocytosis. They love to bulk eat any type of pathogen that might be in their way. So the fact that their cytoplasmic content is very fluid allows them to extend their coverage of their environment. So it makes it easier to detect any type of um, abnormal cell or a bacterial cell that it might come across and grab it and eat it. And then last but not least, here we see a cell that's in the middle of vision or reproduction. And these are actually two yeast cells well, it's actually one yeast cell that's about to become two, and you can see the little nuclei in each of them, and you can see right over here the cleavage furrow that's making its way, indicating that it's going to do cytokinesis, splitting of the cytoplasm, and pretty sure it will bud off, and you'll have two individual daughter cells ready to go ahead and start their day-to-day -day activity. So as you can see, as you look across all five pictures, each of these cells are extremely diverse in their overall appearance, and each of them obviously will also have very unique features um, that will set one organism apart from the other. However, what we can also look at is the fact that there is some commonality within the cells. And in fact, part of this can be found in what we call the cell theory. Now, the cell theory basically has three parts. It says that the cell is the fundamental unit of life. So that's the smallest part where we can consider it a living entity. The second one is that all organisms are made of at least one cell. So when we look at our paramecium or any bacteria, it's a unicellular organism. But when we look at our plants, um, our fungi, our animal kingdom, there you will not only find unicellular, but also multicellular organisms. 
And then the third part of the tenet basically says that cells come from pre-existing cells. So they don't spontaneously appear or spontaneously generate, but they basically come from other pre-existing cells. So for instance, where did you come from? Well, many moons ago, there was a cell courtesy of your father, sperm, and there was a cell courtesy of your mother, oocyte, that happened to meet up in a fallopian tube to create a zygote or a fertilized egg. And out of that cell came you through the method of mitosis, which basically allowed the cell to just replicate an increase in number and allowed that single fertilized oocyte to become a baby, then a toddler, then a teenager. And now I hope that we're all adults and it will continue on um, to replicate and maintain the cells that we have in our body. So those are the three tenets of the cell theory. The cell is the fundamental unit of life, all organisms are composed of at least one cell, and all cells come from pre-existing cells. And for those of you who have traumatized, thinking about your father's sperm and your mother's oocyte, I would apologize, but you're gonna you're gonna get used to my comments as we start lecturing. <laughs> All right. The next thing you want to think about when we take a look at unity and diversity of the cells is what we like to call the central dogma of science. And the central dogma theory basically says that whenever you look at a cell, it's always going to house DNA. And that DNA will always be able to replicate itself in a very similar pattern whether we're looking at a bacteria cell or a eukaryotic cell, its replication pattern will be very similar. And that DNA will also have the ability to do transcription, which means that it makes a copy of a particular section of it and it converts it into RNA. RNA can then also do translation, which means that its nucleotide sequence can be read and amino acids can be gathered to, full, to fully form a functioning protein. And the protein is often called the workhorse of the cell because proteins have a wide variety of jobs, anywhere from um, producing enzymes to muscle construction. You always have a protein that's involved in the actual work and maintenance and homeostasis of the cell. So the fact that we can have DNA in every single cell, and that DNA is able to go ahead and make a copy of itself in the form of RNA, and RNA can then be read to produce a fully functioning protein. Those sequences of steps is what the central dogma takes a look at. So DNA to RNA is transcription, and RNA to proteins is translation. We're going to have a whole chapter that will talk about location and steps and of course all the gritty detail of it but for now just keep in mind that transcription comes before translation in case you ever get confused it's in alphabetical order c before l which means dna to rna to proteins i also want to point out that anytime you look at dna regardless of what cell you derive it from you're going to notice that very similar to RNA, they are composed of nucleotides. And the nucleotides are the adenine, the thymine, the guanine, the cytosine. And in the case of RNA, there's no T, but there is a U for uracil. And what we see happening is that all organisms have DNA and RNA that's composed of these quote unquote letters. And the behavior of the cell will largely depend on which proteins are being produced. So that's something else that you want to kind of keep in mind. How about this one? It turns out that all living cells are self-replicating collections of catalysts. Cata Catalysts, excuse me, I don't know what that was all about. Um, basically, what we see happening is that it's a self perpetuating cycle. And what we see happening here is that once you have your DNA converted into RNA and your RNA starts producing your proteins, what we see happening is that these same exact proteins are going to be necessary to help catalyze 
the reproduction of both DNA, and if it does the DNA, it also helps with the formation of RNA. So you start creating this like feedback loop system where the three components, the DNA, the RNA, and the proteins, are basically depending on each other for successful control or maintenance of the cell. And this self-replicating cycle is, of course, extremely important because, as we know, most of these nucleotides have a certain lifespan. And what we see happening is that the DNA needs to replicate every time your body is interested in producing new daughter cells, whether this is going to be done through mitosis or through meiosis. And in case you're going, well, what does protein actually have to do with DNA replicating? It can do that all by itself. Well, yeah, the DNA can replicate itself all by itself, but then remember, once you have your DNA replicated, you then have to go in through your stages of mitosis and meiosis, which basically means that you have to take that DNA, divide it in half, and then basically start producing new daughter cells. And the movement of the DNA so that you can divide them in different batches, that, for instance, is all guided through microtubules in the cell itself. Microtubules are examples of proteins. The other thing is that the entire cell cycle, so if you take a look at like prophase, metaphase, anaphase, telophase, the stages of mitosis, and if you repeat it twice, meiosis, all those stages, the movement of the cell from one stage to the next, are regulated by cell cycle proteins that will determine when it's time for the cell to go from one phase to the next. So proteins really are the workers of the cell, and they will assist with the reproduction of DNA as well as the formation of new cells. There are other ways that we can take a look at the unity and diversity of the cell. Um, so here are kind of like three more things that you want to think about. Um, based on genetics, as well as if you take a look at evolutionary pathway and developmental pathway and behavioral pathways, it's been estimated that all cells um, have evolved from the same ancestral cell. And based on what we know about genomes, we're thinking about that that first ancestral cell, from a biology standpoint, most likely formed about 3.5 billion years ago, and from there it kind of diverged into the wide variety of cells that we see today. And the ability for it to diverge is mostly due to the fact that as the DNA replicates, um, it doesn't always do 100% um, of a identical replication because there are chances that you can develop mutations, which means that you start getting changes in the nucleotide. Now, a mutation can be good because it can allow the cell, for instance, to produce new proteins because it gets a different sequence of the A, the T, the G, and the C. So it can ultimately lead to the production of new proteins that actually make it better adapted to its environment, which increases its survival rate and its reproduction rate. Um, it can obviously be detrimental because a mutation can cause different disease models. Um, it can also shut down transcription or translation early, making the cell not as successful and thereby most likely not able to reproduce. And then mutations can also be neutral. A lot of the mutations that we see in the human genome tend to fall in the neutral category because they fall into pieces of our DNA that are not used for transcription and eventually translation. So even though you have a quote-unquote mistake, it's never noticed because we don't use it. It falls in a non-coding region. Another thing you want to think about that can create diversity is the fact that certain organisms, including humans, do sexual reproduction. When you do sexual reproduction, you create an offspring that's a hybrid, a mix of both of these DNA samples from the maternal and the paternal side. And that will often increase your genetic variation because they inherit their DNA from multiple sources. This part has obviously long been studied, and some of you might even recall it from your biology class, where you looked at things that our DNA will determine what adaptations we have, and adaptations make us either favorable or unfavorable in our environment. 
and innately we're out to seek a mate that is best fit for the environment because that would mean that they're able to provide food, have lots of energy, provide shelter. So this of course falls under natural selection, which I know some of you like to call survival of the fittest, but it basically means with natural selection that on an innate level, so on a genetic level, we tend to find partners that will increase our chances of survival for our offspring. And as you have natural selection, or even as you have um, sexual reproduction, as well as just mutations, um, we see that can all lead to evolution, which is a genetic change in the makeup of the population. And as evolution occurs, it gives us a direct way of developing new subspecies and species that are genetically different from their original ancestral lineage. Genes can also provide instructions for the form, the function, and the behavior. That will all have to do with, we look at our genome, so our entire collection of DNA. What we see is that all our cells have the same DNA, but yet these cells will look different and behave different. And that will all have to do with what section of the genome is actually being utilized. So which genes which piece of DNA is actually being utilized, what proteins are being produced within the cell. This will completely affect um, the cell expression. Also the environmental components, is there enough nutrition available in the environment? That will also, for instance, um, detail how fast the cell can reproduce. This all plays a hand in trying to explain how you can have millions of cells within the body, but each of them behave differently. So for instance, think about your skin cell. Your skin cell is all about providing a barrier and protection. Whereas if you take a look at your kidney cell, that one's gonna be more interested in filtering, um, making sure that you have enough water within the body. So each of these cells have DNA, and that DNA is exactly the same with its 46 chromosomes, but yet it's using different parts of the gene, of the genome, I should say, to express different genes, and that will then go ahead and play a role in differential cell functions. The other thing, and we've kind of seen this in our picture before when we started our lecture, is that cells will have a very, uh, will vary enormously in both appearance as well as in function. So there's lots of unity and there's also some diversity. And one thing I want you to think about is that as we have these little topics comparing and contrasting different cells, there are some things that all cells will always have in common, okay? All cells will always have DNA, and if you have DNA, you will have RNA, and if you have RNA, you can make proteins with the help of ribosomes, so DNA, RNA, ribosomes, and proteins. So those are four things that all cells will have in common. And then the last two items is that all cells will have a plasma membrane, or some of you might call it a cell membrane, because this provides the border that separates the inside and the outside of the cell. And the internal working of the cell, the cytoplasm, all cells will have that as well. So please keep in mind that there are six things that all cells have in common. We have our DNA, and you guys have to forgive me, I don't really know how to write with this mouse. DNA, we have our RNA, we have our ribosomes, that's my little I version, I'm going to abbreviate ribosomes. We have our proteins. And then we're going to have our cell membrane, which is the border of the cell. And then we have our cytoplasm, which is the internal working of the cell. So please keep those six items in mind that all cells will have. All right, so let's talk a little bit about the microscope. And um, I do want to point out that the book has a really nice table towards the end of the chapter, where if you want to kind of take a look at some of the scientists and hallmark events that led us to our knowledge of self, it will basically in chronological order, that little table. Um, it will kind of explain and give you lots of different examples. Please don't worry about memorizing that table or the name of the scientist or the year. That's something you can easily look up. 
Um, in fact, I didn't even put the table in the PowerPoint because I figured if you were interested, you would kind of find it in the book. So that's just a little FYI in case you want to get some additional reading done. I do want to mention about the microscope. And the first microscope came around the 17th century. Um, usually Robert Hooke and Anthony van Leeuwenhoek are credited with making the first working light microscopes that basically used glass and light to reflect on an item. And what the microscope did is it magnified, obviously it made the object larger, and it also provided resolution, which is kind of clarity of the image. Now, when the light microscope was discovered, that was one of the first entities that actually aided with the discovery of cells as well. In fact, the story goes that Robert Hooke took small little shavings of a cork, stuck it under his little homemade microscope, which depended on light for magnification, and when he looked at the cork shavings, he saw these small little compartments, and he named those compartments cellula, which is where we derive the word cells from. So based on being able to magnify these different objects, they were able to see that there are these like smaller structures that work together and to form this object. And that is then where the discovery of self came from. Um, the other thing that you want to think about is that there's a wide variety of different microscopes. The light microscope is the most popular one. It's also the cheapest one because, like I said, it uses light for reflection and to increase the magnification and the resolution. And in fact, what you can do is you can go ahead and take a look at the illustrations on the PowerPoint. Here is an illustration from... Um, one of the first um, notebooks found that mentions the use of the microscope, and you can actually see the cell dividing itself. So you can see the DNA coiling up, and you can see metaphase starting to occur, where the chromosome kind of aligns in the center of the cell. Here's your anaphase, where it starts to pull apart, and you can see that it starts coiling back up to reform the nucleus. And here is the little cell plate, because we're looking at a plant that shows the formation of cytokinesis. At the bottom is a comparison of what it will look like under a light microscope. So as you can see, the drawings are pretty accurate. On the other side, we have more of a detailed drawing that kind of shows you how the cells will work together to form larger objects. These, of course, are different tissues. We also see that cells can bundle together in little tubules or little eyelids. And then you'll have cells that will be found, for instance, on the kind of like the extracellular component of it. Through the development of different stains, as well as using computers to kind of enhance the images, we've been able to also see the internal mechanisms of the cell with greater detail. So as you can see right here on this illustration, you have these beautiful like pinkish circles that have been stained on the inside. That of course is the nucleus. You can see them right here in purple but you can also start seeing all the different organelles. However, that often will revolve a higher magnification than the light microscope can give. So in that case, we would go over to an electron microscope. And an electron microscope basically means that instead of using light for magnification, we're gonna use electrons. And because electrons have a shorter wavelength, they're able to significantly increase um, our magnification and our resolution. So for a lot of images that you'll see in the book, especially images that will focus on the smaller organelles, it is an electron microscope that you're using. And keep in mind, when you see these beautiful colors, um, that's actually due to the fact that they've been enhanced. You know, it's very similar to kind of using Photoshop to add some different colors because that makes the drawing obviously a lot more interesting and a lot more eye-catching um, for the students. Here is another look at how your electron microscope can show you the finer details within the cell. 
Once the electron microscope was discovered, a lot of time was being spent on the different components that you would find primarily in a eukaryotic cell. And in a little bit, what we're going to do is we're going to talk about the main components of how the eukaryotic cell can afford to be larger than a prokaryotic cell because it divides up its labor. And when it does so, it does so with the help of things like the smooth ER. Um, here's the ER, it's the endoplasmic reticulum. It tends to be located very close to the nucleus, and that one is divided into smooth ER and rough ER. You also will have your Golgi apparatus, which will be kind of like your little packing house. You'll have lots of um, lysosomes and peroxisomes, as you can see, these kind of look like singular little circles floating around in your cytoplasm because those are what we like to call housekeeping organelles. Oh, here's our powerhouse. We can't forget about that. Here's the mitochondria. You can see its shape right over here. The mitochondria is essential for our chemical energy, our ATP production. And also, if we come over to the right-hand side, all these little dots, those are ribosomes. Ribosomes are extremely essential to protein production. As we were chit-chatting before when we talked about all things that cells have in common. And then here we can also see a beautiful string of our DNA molecule, which normally is housed in the nucleus. There you go. Now, just to kind of give you an idea of how much a microscope can actually magnify, we can go ahead and take a look at the illustration that's being presented to us. So here, what they do is they basically want to see how big the cells actually are in the relationship of a structure that we might be very familiar with. So they went ahead and they picked the thumb. And then what they did is for every image that you see, they're basically going to magnify it 10 times. And you can kind of follow the size along. And as you can see, as you magnify each image 10 times, you start to see more and more detail with the cells. So these are the tissues. And then you see the cells. And then you start seeing the internal mechanism of the cell. Here's my little mitochondria. And then I start seeing my little proteins at work. And you can basically just keep going until you get to the atom level. And what you can also do is you can come over to your left hand side and you can see how the visible, um, what's visible with the unaided eye, it's relatively limited to what you can actually see when it comes to our details, right? We can't really see ourselves. So for that, we're going to use the assistance of the light microscope. And if we want to see more detail, we can actually use the fluorescent microscope, which also is assisted by light for magnification, but because it has a fluorescent marker, makes it a little bit easier for us to see smaller detail. And then last but not least, the best one, if you want to get as small as possible and you want to see things like ribosomes, you really won't be able to see atoms. That's not really true on this drawing. Um, you have to rely on an electron microscope. If you want to get more information on all the different microscopes that are out there, or I should say the most commonly used microscopes that are out there, go ahead and take a look at panel that at the panel, it's called panel 1.1 on microscopy. Um, it is located in chapter one of your textbook, obviously, and it will give you small little details of all the different microscopes. Um, on my end, I just really want you to know that the conventional microscope is the light microscope and that the function of the microscope is obviously magnification, increasing the amount that you see, and resolution, which is the clarity. Um, one thing that I also want to point out about a light microscope is that even though um, it's somewhat limited as to what you can see inside a cell, what makes it really nice besides the fact that it's the cheapest option, it's also that you're able to see both living cells, living samples, as well as fixed tissue. So, Hopefully, we've all been in a lab where we went to get a slide. That slide would be an example of a fixed tissue where the item has been stained and you can kind of look at it and nothing's moving. Um, but at the same time, you can also get like a water sample and you can see all the different protozoas floating around uh, within your light microscope. On the other hand, if you're going to use an electron microscope, 
the item that you're looking at cannot be alive. So you actually have to kill it, you have to slice it, you have to fix it, you have to stain it. And then with the electron microscope, it will allow you to have a higher degree of magnification and resolution, um, but often that also comes at a significantly higher price. These microscopes are not only very bulky, but they're also very expensive, and they're often linked to a computer to go ahead and kind of adjust and manipulate the images a little bit with coloring. So here on our little panel, it shows you the transmission electron microscope and the scanning electron microscope. The transmission electron microscope, usually abbreviated TEM, is used for internal workings within the cell. So in uh, part two of our lecture for chapter one, we're going to take a look at the different organelles I was mentioning before, the rough ER, the smooth ER, the mitochondria. Whenever you see those images, those are courtesy of a transmission electron microscope. If you want to look more on the outside surface, so the different crevices and extensions, like when we were looking at that beautiful picture of the paramecium with all those little hairs, then you'll use a scanning electron microscope. There's obviously also different ones. Um, I had mentioned the fluorescent microscope, which uses a fluorescent marker. So you can use different probes, and that will allow you to kind of highlight different sections um, of the cell. This is really important, when, especially if you're doing something about its mechanics or its metabolism, and you want to see which part of the cell is more or less active than the other. So there are lots of variations, so please make sure to kind of give this a nice little read-through. But at the end of the day, you just want to be able to tell me what the function of a microscope is, and then just a comparison between the light microscope and I guess the transmission electron microscope and the scanning electron microscope. So let's go ahead and let's take a look at a prokaryotic cell. And the reason we're doing this is because it turns out that when you look at cells and their overall composition, they can usually be classified into two categories, those that have a nucleus and those that do not. The ones that do not are called the prokaryotic cell. Pro means before, so this is kind of like our early version of the cell. Prokaryotic cells are the smallest cells. They are very simplistic in their overall structure. However, they're also the most diverse and numerous cells, and they're by far the oldest cells, especially when you compare them to a eukaryotic cell. So don't let their simplicity fool you. They've been around a lot longer than we have. Um, prokaryotic cells used to just kind of be clustered together in one big category, and we used to say, oh, that's where all bacteria is being housed. And then what we see is that with genomic um, uh, development of different techniques and being able to sequence DNA, we started noticing that not all prokaryotic cells are created equal. So eventually that led to the division of our bacteria into two distinctive domains. You have the bacteria cells and you have your archaea cells. Um, the archaea cells are the oldest ones. Um, they're probably estimating that these were some of our ancestral cells, um, and most likely they basically split from bacteria billions of years ago. Because from a structural aspect, if we look, for instance, at things like their composition of their cell membrane, archaea have very little in common with bacteria. Um, they actually have more in common with eukaryotic cells. Um, either way, archaea, archaic uh, organisms are unicellular organisms. They are prokaryotic, meaning that they don't have a nucleus. Obviously, they have DNA, because all cells have DNA. And some of them can be found in what we call extreme environments. So a lot of times you'll read about that they're extremophiles. So you'll find them in areas like hot water springs, anaerobic environments where most items, where most living organisms can't survive. Um, you can find them in like volcanic areas with extremely low pHs. So they love these extreme environments. But there's also been some samples that have been found in quote unquote normal environments, including our oral cavity. So just a little FYI. Anyways, back to the bacteria we go. Um, bacteria are unicellular, and what we see happening is that even though they're one-celled organisms, they do tend to cluster together, um, so they'll interact with each other. And what we see happening is that usually their cell is composed of 
three different shapes. We have our spears. Now, some of you might call them cocci, which is completely fine, but these are the circular types of bacteria. And as you can see, they can interact with each other by clumping together. We have our rods. Some of you might call those bacillus, which is also completely normal. That's the scientific name of the shape. And then you have your spiral cells, are the spiriliums, which kind of look like little corkscrews underneath the microscope. So they'll have a unique little like ribbon type of turn that they'll come into play. Now on your right hand side, you have good old fashioned E. coli. E. coli is a widely studied bacteria. You can find it um, in a lot of places, including our gut. <coughs> and what we see happening in our picture right here is the lighter stained area. That is the DNA that the E. coli is housing. The DNA of a prokaryotic cell is usually put in what we call a nucleoid. And a nucleoid is just kind of like a little housing mechanism. It's by no means as diverse as a eukaryotic cell because it still allows the DNA to make free contact with the cytoplasm. And it, it's not like a control center. I like to think of it kind of like a little Ziploc bag or just an envelope. So it will just kind of cluster the DNA together in this nucleoid section. Also notice on your drawing that they went ahead and they did label the plasma membrane, which is the border, that's what all cells have, and then also the cytoplasm, which is the internal workings of the cell. Now, something that a bacteria cell has that animal cells, including us, do not have is the addition of a cell wall. And the cell wall is basically another layer, so here's my plasma membrane, that sits on top of the plasma membrane and gives an, an additional, um, structural view but also a protective view to the bacteria and most bacteria will also have a third layer around their cell wall and that third layer is called the capsule and for some bacteria the capsule will be made out of a sugary layer making it very sticky so it can adhere to surfaces better in fact if I want to give you a very simplistic example most of us when we wake up in the morning, we're going to notice that we have a little bit of holotosis. We have a little bit of bad breath. And if we take our tongues and we kind of glide it towards the front of our teeth, we're going to notice that it's a little bit slimy. And the reason you're feeling that is because overnight while you were sleeping, the bacteria in your mouth, which is completely normal, had an excellent chance to reproduce. Um, bacteria cells can reproduce very quickly. They can reproduce both asexually as well as sexually. Um, most bacteria, if we're looking at their small genome, within 20 minutes to an hour, they can reproduce. So imagine if you're sleeping for your eight hours. I hope we're all getting eight hours of sleep. Um, that bacteria load has a huge opportunity to increase while you're sleeping. And what the bacteria does is it uses its capsid that outer layer, that sticky layer, to kind of adhere to the surface of your teeth. And that's what you're feeling when you're sliding over it. Now, don't panic because hopefully a lot of us will brush our teeth, right? So as you're brushing your teeth, what you're doing is you're mechanically removing that capsule layer so the bacteria falls off. And afterwards, your teeth are going to feel a lot cleaner than they did beforehand. In fact, um, some bacteria, for instance, that causes pneumonia, the reason that makes them so potent is because they're able to stick to your lung tissue. Luckily, we have a wide variety of antibiotics, including some that can dissolve the capsid layer so that the bacteria cells fall off and thereby your immune system can kind of take over and destroy them. What else do I want to tell you about bacteria? Um, they are relatively small and simple. I mentioned that to you before. We mentioned the nucleoid section that's going to house the DNA. Um, they tend to evolve very fast, and part of that is because they have a small genome coupled with the fact that they can do both sexual and asexual reproduction. So they have a wide ability, availability of different DNA samples if they're doing their sexual reproduction. Oh, and then I also want to say that a lot of bacteria will utilize a flagella. A flagella is a little whip-like structure. Here's my little tail that I'm drawing. And they'll use it for motility. 
including E. coli. E. coli uses several flagellas to move around. Unfortunately, they're not pictured on the drawing that we're looking at. If you want to kind of have a better idea of what a flagella looks like, just think about a sperm cell. The little tail of a sperm cell, that's a flagella. Um, gentlemen, you are the proud owners of the only human cell that has a flagella. So there you go. Ladies, don't feel left out. Um, the sperm cell, just because it has the flagella, is also the smallest cell that the body produces. We are the owners of the largest cell, which is the oocyte, the unfertilized egg that ovulates. Okay? So there you go. Each of us have a prize-winning possession. Now, having said that, I am going to end part one of chapter one right over here. Um, I like to keep the lectures within an hour so you don't get too bored of me. And also feel free to kind of stop and pause as you're going along. Um, and like I said, if you have any questions, comments, or concerns, feel free to email me or stop by virtual office hours. And I completely forgot to mention this previously. I will also be opening up discussion sessions on D2L. So if you are willing to share your questions, please jump on the discussion. It's a really nice way to kind of involve everybody in the class because chances are if you have a question, someone has a very similar question to it. So that way we can kind of go back and forth and everybody is uh, welcome to reply to the discussion threads. I'll be keeping an eye on it and obviously also providing my opinion. And if I see any incorrect statements, I'll be sure to highlight those as well. Um, but beyond that, I hope you guys enjoyed the first part of chapter one. And whenever you're ready, go ahead and start listening to the second part. All right, uh, we shall talk soon. Bye.